today I've titled um, the sermon, the message as learning from a patriarch. You know patriarchs are people. Patriarch, uh, we study from the Bible that patriarchs are people who have been esteemed in a very important, significant way. And there are quite a few patriarchs in the Bible. But today I'm going to learn from a patriarch who is very familiar to all of us. And his name is Abram. First he was called Abram. And only later, after a period of time, his name was changed to Abraham. So we are going to go through a few chapters in Genesis and also read a summary of Abraham's life from the book of Hebrews. And uh, we learn how when God chooses people, when God chooses you and me, what are the steps that we have to go through or what are the stages that we have to pass through in order to fulfill God's purpose for our lives? Well, we know that uh, Abraham is called the father of faith. He is a father of faith and he is a father of the Jews. And he first is given a promise by God. So the first stage for anyone to know whether they are on the path with the Lord is, have you received a promise from God? Have you received a purpose for your life? And this is given to you only if you or I have truly encountered Jesus. Why would I say that? Because, I mean, God created everybody on this planet Earth. Each and every one. But not everybody b belongs to the family of God. You know, God created everybody. The whole, everyone who is out there belongs to him. But what he has enacted is, he has set in process because of, we know the story of the fall when we read in Genesis chapter 3, where our forefather, Adam and Eve, when they sinned, there was a huge gulf that happened between God and man. So man had no way to reach God, absolutely separated. There is no way that you and I can even call on him. But then God started to set into motion this process of salvation. And in that, Abraham is a key figure. And he is given a promise right here in Genesis chapter 12. We'll pick it up from there and then we'll move through certain chapters. And then we will read his summary in Hebrews. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your country your people and your father's household and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. So. The promise is given. God chooses somebody. And here God chooses Abraham and gives him a promise and tells him, I will make you into a great nation. I'm going to bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. It's a covenant made to Abraham. An amazing covenant. Amazing covenant to Abraham. When you come into a relationship with the Lord, 
you will receive a promise. You will receive a purpose. Till then, you may be out there doing whatever, but then once you come to know the Lord, and you know that He has chosen you, and He will tell you, this is the purpose for which I have created you. Because now what, when I say that you have entered into a relationship with the Lord, what do I mean? It is that you have understood and known that you are a sinner and that you needed a savior. Like we've been hearing a series of sermons this past week from Pastor Greg. Keys to the kingdom. You enter into the kingdom. What are the keys to the kingdom that he has preached on? He has preached on, anybody remembers? Faith, freedom, patience, very good. Peace and love, excellent. You all remember that. You see faith. Faith is a key to the kingdom. And here you see, I'm talking about a man of faith here who's supposed to believe when this God whom he does not even know, suddenly calls out to him and says, I have chosen you, I'm going to make you a blessing. How many of us, if God says, now at this juncture, in this situation, to go to this place, that you know certain things are happening, or you do not know, you have to go there. It's kind of something where Abraham has no clue. And he is obedient right here. He leaves everything and he goes. And that is a promise that he is holding on to right at the start of his life. So do you have a promise? Do you have a purpose in your life? Have you truly unlocked the key into the kingdom with faith, as we've heard? With freedom, patience, Peace, love. Have you unlocked it? Have you entered into the kingdom? Because this transformation process or this translation process is called you are moving from the kingdom of darkness, the domain of darkness, into the kingdom of God's son whom he loves. It is a kingdom transaction. And this kingdom transaction actually has its origin right here in this promise. That is why when you encounter Jesus, we will come to that and you will see how Jesus makes a very important connection in Abraham's story. So Abraham receives a promise. So the first stage in any Christian's life, have you received a promise? Number one. Do you have a promise from the Lord? Do you have a purpose for your life? Do you have a purpose? Or are you just living purposeless, not knowing what's going to happen, just going by every day? Because it is said that God has prepared for us good works in advance for us to do. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 it says, For we are God's handiwork or God's masterpiece, recreated or created in Christ Jesus, to do good work that God has already ordained or prepared for us to do. So if you do not know what it is, that means you have still not unlocked and entered into the kingdom. Because anybody who is in the, in the kingdom has work to do. You are not a spectator in God's kingdom. Amen. There are no spectators. We all like to spectate. But you know, there are no spectators. You all, we all have specific work to do. I have a specific work to do. You have a specific work to do. Have you found out what that work is? He gives you a clear blueprint. Though it may be going, I mean, zigzag or whatever, you will arrive at that. He will take you there. You will see how there is a detour that Abraham takes, but then he comes back. So the first thing is promise. The second stage is preparation. 
there is always a time of preparation till we achieve or accomplish God's promise in our life. You know, he had to wait 25 years, Abraham. Jesus himself waited 18 years because the first uh, the recorded uh, incident of Jesus at the age of 12 is uh, there in the scripture and after from 12 to 30 we do not hear about him. 12 to 30 is 18 years. And what did uh, Jesus do during those 18 years? People do not know. It is not recorded for us. What he did. But you know if you ask the JBQers, ask them the question, what did Jesus do from the age of 12 to 30 till he started his ministry? They will give you a beautiful answer. You know what's the answer that they will give you? He was obedient to his parents and he stayed with them. Yes, he was staying with his parents. He was obedient. So even until you are 30, young men can stay with your parents. <laughs> Jesus has set an example. You don't have to leave home. I don't know why in this country they send everybody out at 18. You can stay till 30. So I don't know why that's the age that even guys these days even think of marriage. I don't know. But anyway, there's a, there's a time of preparation for 18 years. And you see, Joseph waits another 15 years. Moses, 40 years. Think about it. He grew up in the palace. And after that, he was sent out to the wilderness for 40 years till what God said he was going to do with him, the work started with Moses. So there is a period of preparation for all of us. There is a period of preparation. So unless you know the promise, you will be able to stay through this period of preparation. And you need patience during that time. So the third, first thing is the promise. Second is a period of preparation. And during preparation, three, uh, during preparation, two things happen. But uh, I'm going to say that that's a third stage. That is patience and perseverance. I'm going to put it both together. Patience and perseverance. So let's look at this. Abraham has been given a promise. He was 75 years old. We read that in Genesis chapter 12. Let's move on. 13, 14, 13, certain things happen. We are not going to go through that. And then in Genesis chapter 15, God gives him, appears to him again in a vision and says, Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield, your very great reward. And then he goes on. And then in Genesis chapter 16, what happens is, during the time of preparation, his patience is getting tested. So when you are in the time of preparation, your patience will be tested. It will be tested. So the test will come usually through people very close to you, who are around you. And right here you see, let's start with Genesis chapter 16. So the test is beginning. So people who are married, this is the template, okay? Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, but she had Egyptian maid servant. She had an Egyptian maid servant named Hagar. So she said to Abraham, "The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my maid servant. Perhaps I can build a family through her." So right from within the family, his patience is being tested. Here is a man who is wanting to be patient, who is waiting on the Lord, and here comes a woman. That's how it all starts. Adam, he was, he was all right, till Eve came in. You know, men left by themselves, they'll be okay. But God's design is that he can't leave men alone. And that's why he provided a woman. Right there. And then starts everything. Then the adventure starts. The life starts. The real life. So, here Sarai comes in. And we know the story. Hagar. And then 
this is not the promise. He messes up. So even when you are in the period of preparation, if you mess up, you have hope. You have hope. You don't have to lose hope. We are humans. We are patient. We are, when, when we are being, it's very difficult for us to be patient. We can't wait. I mean, at least earlier, people used to wait. They knew what it was because, um, you know, um, my father-in-law was able to even show me the telegram which said that a daughter is born. That is my wife. He, she kept it. I saw it. I don't know how many of y'all have seen a telegram. What's a telegram? You don't know what's a telegram. So, they, they used to wait. They can't even. The communication was so slow. But now it's all so instantaneous. This becomes a much more difficult proposition. Waiting becomes extremely difficult. And that is where God actually works. And you know what? Sometimes, many times we think this walk of Christian faith is a sprint. It is never a sprint. It is a marathon. It is a marathon. It is a process. It takes time. I am not who I was 25 years ago. I am such a good man now. Do you know that? Ask my wife. I have changed. The God has his time to prune you. God has his time to shape your character through the experiences of life. You never remain the same. And he needs time. You know, certain things we think, you know, can happen just like an instant. Like you can take a pill and then it happens. If it could, if it could, if it could be possible, I think we all would be... We will we'll all prefer to have those pills. If a pill could, if I could suggest, oh, this pill, if you take three times a day, will create patience inside of you. I think you all will go and buy it. I want patience. Three times a day. This medicine, that's all I have to do. I'll take that. Immediately I'll go get the medicine and I will start following that. So that I can develop patience. But you know what? God doesn't work that way. He's an old-fashioned, traditional person. He takes time. And he needs time. You know why sometimes we think we need... The human nature is so complex. We sometimes underestimate it. The human nature is so complex, so intricately woven, that it takes time to change our nature. We have such stubbornness inside of us. In order to break us, God has to put us through so many experiences. So as the preparation is taking place, I told you the third stage is patience and perseverance. See, you're patient. Here he was not patient. He messed up. And then what happens? That, does God give up on him? No, in Genesis 17, he goes back to him and again promises him. He reaffirms the promise in verse 6. He tells him, but in chapter 17, verse 1, he says, When Abram was 99 years old, now imagine, it's almost 24 years. The Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty, walk before me, and he adds on to this, and be blameless. Why would he use the word blameless now? Abraham, you have done something which I had not intended, or you, did, I mean, was not expected, but now, what's happening? He's saying, now from here on in, walk before me and be blameless. And then I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Then Abram fell face down. And God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. And he reaffirms it. And, by, and this is where the name change occurs. You know, there's a name change. So after he messed up, Abraham does, did not say, no, Lord, you know, unlike Adam, you know, I did not do it, Lord. You know, Sarah only told me to do it. That's why I messed up. Otherwise, uh, you know what, I would, have not, I would have waited long. You see, Abraham owns up. He falls face down, and when he's falling face down, prostrate before God, what is he saying? 
God, you're right. I messed up. He's repenting. He's saying, yes, I messed up. You gave me a promise. I messed up. I didn't wait. He falls face down and then he's, God is re, uh, confirming, reaffirming the covenant and then he says, no longer will you be called Abraham. Your name will be Abraham for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan where you are now an alien I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you and I will be their God. See how God is such a compassionate God, forgiving God. He forgave Abraham and then brought him back into his relationship, reaffirmed the covenant and said, listen, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not going to go back on my word. I never go back on my word. I've given you a promise. You have a purpose in life. My purpose for your life will never change. Unless you want to detour and go some other way, I will let you go. But if I have a purpose, I will wait till you come back to me. Because there are certain things God has destined, destined for us and he will wait and he will say, no, till you do what I want you to do. It doesn't mean that he is unyielding. He is so loving that he wants, because he has created, created you in such a specific manner for a specific purpose, he wants you to yield to his purpose. And when you yield to his purpose, he will start showing you what you are created to be. Sometimes we think in our mind, this is what it's going to be. But you know, God's plans, God's thoughts for us are mind-boggling, are different. So, yielding to God. So, patience, perseverance. See, patience is something you just tolerating somebody else to an extent. But perseverance is something more. I would call, call it like this. If patience is just tolerating or enduring under a difficulty or waiting, because we are all patient. We all need to be patient when a traffic light is red. You can't rush. You got to be patient before, behind the student driver. You can't rush. You have to be patient in a shopping line when uh, you have to pay, pay at the checking counter. You have to wait. You can't rush. So that is being patient. How many of you, how many of you all have seen somebody uh, at the check -in, I mean, at the checkout counter standing there and then they are not able to wait and then they immediately leave? Yep. They leave the stuff and go. So now they have self-check-in, right? And even self-check-in now becomes very busy. And then you want to go into the normal check-in. You go and see that the line is too long, you go to the normal check-in. So that is patience. That's inbuilt. That's part of life. But perseverance is patience on steroids. Perseverance is patience on steroids. It's beyond patience. It would have tested your patience. You are done and dusted, but still, you've got to persevere. And when you are patiently persevering, remember what will happen. There will be a test that will happen to you. You will be given tests to pass. You have to pass those tests in order to receive the promise. And now that takes me to Genesis chapter 22. Go to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 21, what happens is Isaac is born. The promised son. The promised son Isaac is born. He receives the promise at the age of 100. 75 years promised. 86 he messed up. Another 14 years he lives. 100 years he receives Isaac, the promised one. But you know what? Genesis chapter 22. Sometime later, they say... Uh, Isaac could be probably 11 or 12, around that age. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and uh, he says, here I am. Then God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, 
and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. And even here you see the obedience of Abraham. Immediately it says, early the next morning, he did not go and consult his wife, he did not consult anybody else. Early the next morning, Abraham got up, saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. We know the story. A very um, familiar story to all of us. Where Abraham is your only son. Does that echo something to you? Does it echo something to you? I'm going to connect it to the person of Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You see there is an echo right here in Genesis 22 to John 3.16. Your only son, your only son. Abraham obeys. He goes and he passes the test. The first test, he failed. But this time, this man is strengthened. He knows that this God is for real. He knows that this God is a God of words, that he will fulfill the promise. Whatever he has given, he will deliver on his word. We do not have to doubt. And even if it comes to laying down your son on the altar as a sacrifice, he's saying, Lord, you can have him. You can have him. Yes, the promise tells me that it is through this son that you are going to do everything. It is illogical to me. It doesn't, doesn't connect in my mind that you are asking me to lay the son on the altar. It doesn't reason. But you know what? The scripture says when Abraham believed it was credited to him as righteousness. It was credited to him as righteousness. It was a righteous way of life. Just believing in what God said was being righteous. It was a credit to Abraham and he laid him on the altar. And you know what happened? God stopped him midway. Now I know Abraham, you're obedient. Now we know Abraham, you're obedient. Do not let that sword fall down, that knife fall down. So when you are being, when you are persevering, when you are in that time of waiting, there will be tests. Are you passing those tests? Because unless you pass those tests, you will be able to fulfill or the purpose or the promise. So we start with the promise period of preparation and during the period of preparation you have patience and perseverance which we need to execute in our life and you know when the tests are happening I think of these two kinds of tests that uh, I have been used to coming from the East two kinds of tests one is in the Eastern uh, system of education uh, it's all like you you memorize a lot of stuff you have to study you need to know the whole book you will not even have questions given out to you you know, you have to study everything and you don't know how the question paper is going to be. And then what questions are going to be asked? Nothing. You just go sit down there. So we have, we have called like uh, some of the Indians in the Indian system or the Eastern system there. We have called as bookworms. We are supposed to be bookworms. As long as you, are you study the whole book, you are good. You have to study. You need to memorize. And then whatever question comes, you will be able to answer. But you know, after coming to the West, I saw a different kind of educational system, which is, which is good actually, where, you know, they, the teachers sometimes they give out the test also. They'll tell you what the test is going to be. They say, this is where the test is going to be, go study. And then there's another thing that they do here, which was very interesting to me. They give an open book test. You know, they'll give an open book test. They'll tell you, okay, the question will be asked. I won't tell you the question, but it's an open book. You need to know where the answers are. So the open book, you can take it. But you know, I was thinking, God, which is the system that God uh, approves of? I think he, he's, uh, he approves of the American system of education. Open book test. You know why? He has given us this book. 
and all the tests, the answers to the tests that we face are in this book. The problem is we don't have to go to anybody else. You open this book and if you read, you will know the answer to your problem. You will know the answer to the test that you're facing. You will know how to, how to pass those tests. Because there are so many people who are mentioned in the scripture where uh, how they endured those things and how they successfully came out of it. So that will give you an encouragement that you can also do the same. Because the scripture is an example for us. So patience and perseverance. And now the fourth stage. Promise first, second preparation, patience and perseverance. And the fourth and the final stage. This, this is what happens. And as he's coming down, as Abraham is coming down to slay Isaac, the Lord stops him. And then he says, he looks around and then he sees a ram in the thicket. And then he takes that ram for sacrifice. And it is at that place, it is at that place, Abraham says, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord has provided. So the fourth stage is provision. The fourth stage is provision. He provides. He provides for everything. If there is a promise and a purpose in your life, he will provide. But you need to pass through the other two stages of preparation, patiently persevering and passing your test. And when you do that, you will see the pro provision of God. The great provision of God is waiting for you. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord has provided. And that is where Abraham worshipped and he said, He is my God whom I know. He is my provider. You sing that beautiful song. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provides. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provides. Hebrews chapter 11 has a quick summary of the story. A very quick summary. Hebrews captures summaries of the patriarchs of the Bible. Quick ones. You'll see some uh, quick summary of Moses because it is written to the ancient Jews to prove that Jesus is greater than Moses, greater than Abraham, etc. So here, a quick summary of Abraham. Hebrews chapter 11, it's in the hall of faith, chapter 8, uh, verse 8. By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land, like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, a kind of a kingdom that we've been hearing about, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and as countless as the sand on the seashore. A quick summary of Abraham's story in Hebrews 11. What is the connection between Abraham and Jesus? I said the only son. And it is Jesus is the seed of Abraham. And you will see that in Matthew where the genealogy is given. Starting from Abraham. That Jesus comes through at the end the promised Messiah for the Jewish people and not only for them but also for us as Gentiles. Jesus comes in. When Jesus comes into the picture, one day, one of the accusations, there are several accusations that they made against Jesus. And one of the accusations was this. And that is recorded in John chapter 8. What happens is they are questioning his authority. And then when they are questioning his authority, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law ask him, Are you greater than Abraham? We have Abraham as our father. We know who Abraham is. He is the man. We are all his followers. I mean, we are all his descendants. And he is the patriarch for us. Are you greater than Abraham? 
and Jesus said, Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. And when they accused him of this, he said, Yes, before Abraham was, I am. And you know what they did? They picked up stones to fling at him, to throw at him. Jesus, the son of Abraham, he is the ultimate sacrifice. What did not fall down on Isaac fell down on Jesus at the cross. Jesus became our savior. Jesus is our savior who laid his life down for us so that you and I can receive a kingdom that lasts forever, that we can reign with him forever and ever. Have you truly entered into the kingdom, learning from the patriarch Abraham? Are you passing through the stages? Have you received a promise? Are you in the stage of preparation? You are always being prepared for the next thing that God is, has for us. But are you in that period of preparation? Are you understanding where you are? And are you patiently persevering and passing the tests that come during that period of preparation? And if you do that, you will receive the greatest provision. And that provision is Jesus himself. Along with all the other things. Because he who did not spare his own son and gave him up for us all, how will he not along with him give us all things that we might enjoy? Romans, Paul writes for us. God did not spare his own son for us. And we are actually entering into a season, the next 40 days. Many of the churches, the traditional churches, they follow. But it's not important whether uh, the season of Lent is being followed in a particular church or not. But it is a period of preparation as we enter, as we enter into this uh, time when we are going to conclude with Good Friday and Easter. And uh, it's starting this week. And may I plead with you that you will enter into this time, the next four weeks or so before Easter, to, to have a time of preparing your hearts before God on a regular basis to meditate on the cross on what Jesus' sacrifice means to you and to me. He's our savior. He's our ultimate provision. So learn, let's learn from Abraham that God is a God of promise. God is a God who keeps his covenant promise no matter what, even if we fail, he never fails. He never fails. Would you turn your eyes to the cross where Jesus was slain for us. We are going to sing that song as a preparation to help us to meditate on the cross. Whichever stage of life you are in, if you have not received a promise, I plead with you to receive the promise. May, the, may today be the day you are in the period of preparation, ask the Lord to help you to continue to be patient and persevere faithfully so that at the end of it you will see the provision of God being fulfilled in your life. Let's turn our eyes to the old rugged cross. Just linger in prayer for a few moments, even as the music is played. Whatever situation you are in, why not you just pray personally to your Father in heaven? He hears you. He is a God of promises. Ask Him for strength to persevere. Ask Him for the promise. Ask him for the provision. 
for him to show it to you where it comes from he is jehovah jireh from the bottom of your heart you ask him be patient and to persevere in God's will for our lives and the only place of hope is to cling to the old rugged cross just cling to the old rugged cross come to the foot of the cross that is where you will find grace hope and help in time of need may the god of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power the holy spirit with the grace of the lord jesus christ the love of god the fellowship of the holy spirit abide with us all now and forever